So I'm gonna switch to my first language. I've spoken French before, but Sarah doesn't speak French really, so. She, she, yeah, she, French. C'est, tu bon? Bonjour. la directrice du docu. So I was wondering if anyone uh, has any questions for either one of us. And actually, if you do want us to ask in French, we'll understand, so. Don't be shy. How came the idea of making the documentary? Um, what, what triggered it? Was it the end, the announced end of the... Well, it's not official. Well, I didn't know, we didn't know the end of the studio at the time we started making it. It was more that it, it existed, because it's huge. And spaces just aren't that big anymore, and so much music has been recorded there. So the idea that this huge, cavernous studio was just 20 minutes away, I didn't know it, I didn't know that it had existed until someone told me about it, and, and we're like, oh my god, how is this real? And so the documentary was made. Yeah, I, I, just to elaborate on that, I, I think that the, the gentrification angle in this was significant because it existed at the moment and there was definitely threats to it and, and threats that could happen. So it wasn't because we thought it was really gonna, you know, bite the dust in a year or anything like that. Um, I mean, honestly, even if there was one scene where I guess maybe, maybe I'll have 10 years Maybe I will, but it is the writings, as I said, the writings on the wall. Maybe, but that so that didn't. That's not what forced it through. Also, it's kind of interesting. I never really thought about it, but what I think sort of interested a lot of people, because the, the response in Brooklyn and New York has been pretty good to the documentary, and I think what what sort of surprised a lot of people, or just sort of part of the chemistry, is that you don't, you can't see even the building, where the studio is. The actual building itself can't be seen from the street. It's in the middle of the block. I mean, you see the outside, but that's not really where the studio is. It's, it's, so you would never know in a way. So it, is, it does add to this sort of like hidden thing. So it, when, it, you know, there's no sign that says BC Studio, you know, and it's, it's bigger than you would think. So if you come off the street, you go, well, it's in the back. And then you go, whoa, it's like this big multi-level space. So in a way, that's probably why, you know, she was like, oh my God, she's probably been around there and never knew and never saw it. So that's part of it. Where the, where the, the, so the clock is ticking. Yeah. The clock is not is ticking. Still? We have plenty of time. Oh, yeah. More questions. Mm. Uh, I'll ask a question. Yes, go ahead, Sebastian. Um, how did the? Uh, I have to make it up now, but I said I'm asking. <laughs> um, how did? Uh, how did? Um, how did you? How did Sonic Youth find you? Oh. Um, I think, um, well, one way they actually found me was the guy dressed as, the guy dressed like an Indian. That was one thing. So they, <laughs> they actually found me so they would see me at shows. Mm. And, you know, I had a headband. And it was, you know, I, I don't know what, I don't know how to explain it, but it was, it was literally, you know, the early 80s. So it really was part of the 70s in a way. Mm. So it was definitely this sort of taxi driver kind of thing. So I would be living in this, like, you know, it, I, I lived in a war zone. Basically, I mean, literally, there was like gangs, these were like militias, warlords. So that's how I looked and that's how I felt safe. I mean, I don't know, it's just part of the whole vibe, street. You know, so I wore headbands, wristbands, beads. I mean, it was like kind of crazy. So that, so I was kind of very easily found. So I think they kind of, they knew that's how I looked. And also maybe, it's funny, I never even thought about it till now. They definitely were in the hip hop thing. They were one of these rockers that were sort of denying that they were rock half the time, you know, um, so they wanted, you know, just like Helmet, when the, the a big tangent, because actually I recorded Helmet, but not at the studio, it's like one of the few, and with Helmet, it was kind of funny, they got like a hip hop producer, same thing again, you know, because it's not about rock, even though it's clearly the rock. Um, Sonic Youth 2, they were sort of in this sort of like, did not, even when they did Chicone Youth, they wanted to make black music, you know, so even when they were doing this, well, we gotta get like some like blackness in there or some, something. You know, so they, um, the fact that I sort of did avant-garde music and did um, the Rocket thing, because they came to me after Rocket. 
So at that point, I didn't even do any rock music. I just did avant-garde stuff. I was like, who's this rock band coming to me? I hadn't kind of heard of them. And um, I think it was the hip hop thing. So they kind of, I think they also saw that I, despite what I recorded, they would see me at like rock shows. I mean, I would go see Swans or whatever, even though I wasn't even, I didn't even know them. So, you know, they, they saw me around. So I think that chemistry, that, that they felt like I understood the language, but they were really into the fact that I um, um, did hip hop. I mean, that was really attractive. Um, so then they found me. Um, with the gentrification of the city, which is becoming really obvious, and, and the, the energy is not the same for new bands coming up to your studio, do you still find that there's this raw edge and there's like bands that have... So what you said, there was this what edge? Raw edge. Raw edge. Raw edge. Raw edge. Raw edge. Yeah. Raw edge. <laughs> yes, go on. So, um, yeah. Do you still find band exciting? Yeah, because for one thing, I don't need that many bands. You know, I can only record four or five or six. So it's weird. I do get a bit of a, a, a biased view. I've always had a biased view. I'm in my little world, and I think it's as big or as small as it may be. And sometimes I don't even know. It's gone both ways. I think I'm in a little world because I'm like, oh, just a few bands. And then I realize, oh, my God, there's like... I mean, people would literally be going, like, do you, you, don't, you don't know what's happening? Like, the, like with Sonic Youth, they were like, you don't know what's happening? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Uh, Dresden Dolls, the same thing. They were like blow, exploding in Boston. There was kids walking around Boston dressed like them. And I was like, I, I don't know, you know? So, um, so my point is, is I think I have found my little niche, and I don't know how little it is. I mean, I know that these are bands that go out and tour and they are on small labels. I, it's hard for me to tell like size or the amount, but it's definitely active. I think there's a lot of really pissed off people in the United States. I think if there's, we're kind of at each other's throats. So I think there's plenty of angst, uh, plenty of existential crisis happening. I mean, we're going insane, literally, I think in New York. And so one thing I've always found, and it's kind of hilarious, is like New York seems to always be at the center of drama, like even right now. It's like, whether it's the criminals with the baseball bats or it's the criminal developers and bankers where it's always, like when people talk about gentrification, yes, they're talking now about San Francisco and stuff, but really what's happening in New York ultimately is the example, always the example of the drama of gentrification. So it seems to be always um, representative of the time and it's always been a hard place. I mean, honestly, I don't love that. I, I'd like it to be an easy place, but I understand that part of the chemistry is that it's, it's nails and hammers. So it's really a hard place to, to survive. So survival is always like, like paramount. So I work with a lot of angsty, <coughs> pissed off bands, and there's a lot of nasty energy. And it's funny because when I realized, when I really realized that it, there's this New York like, like furor, is sometimes when I go on tour and I have like local bands in, work with, you know, like on, on the bills. I always try to get local bands on bills. So I was trying to find you know, when I play anywhere, like in Ohio or something, I try to find, you know, edgy, noisy, you know, bands I think, you know, and they're always less noisy. They're always less angsty. And it's like, oh, wow, it's a little gentler. It's a little easier. It's a little, it's, it's, so there really is kind of a New York thing. But to be honest, it's also because it's, if I might be biased because I know what I'm attracted to and then those people, they're attracted to me. So really, it's hard to tell what's going on. And I will say that there's a lot going on in New York. I mean, I actually don't quite understand how it's possible because it's like this, the rents are so high. Yeah. I guess there's a benefit of New York is that really benefit, uh, really New York is quite big, you know? Like, it, it's funny, the whole area that we're talking about in New York, it's like this little piece of Brooklyn that goes like this and it goes like this, all of this in Brooklyn, so it's amazing how people can still, and they still be on the metro, still be on the subway lines. And yes, it's a little further to commute. And I think it's also really, the, the, by the way, just to say, I don't think that that's all good, because part of, um, part of the chemistry back then is we were all near each other, and I think that makes a big difference. To so really be, be spread out really hurts the scene, really hurts people communicating, um, getting together, all the, the natural happenstance of people running into, all the good stuff. It's difficult when you see the scene as being like, 
you know, two hours apart in a because New York is pretty gigantic. So there's things that kind of save it, but it's still not good. Um, yeah, so I hope I kind of answered the question a little bit. I don't think we've softened up. How would we be softened up? You know, that's what I'm saying. We, we haven't... Yeah, you haven't, but what about the new generation? Um, well, yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough, and it... it, it, it um, um, that could be, but I, I work with a lot of young people. But you're right, I don't know. I work with like, what, 20 young people, and I'm like, wow, there's a lot in there, but there's 20. But on the other hand, when you look back at those days, the people that we still remember, it's like a, a handful. Yeah. You know, we go, oh, it's a, go it's a golden era. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it, it's like, if you ask me to name bands, I'll be like, oh, and I'll come up with like seven or something. So really, it's like it doesn't, it takes a huge village to make the few that really have something, as, as we know, it's not how it works. But, um, so I feel like I'm working with some of the few who are represented in the thing, like Pop 1280, Cinema Cinema, I mean, they're pretty raging, abrasive, you know, you could, it's funny though, because it's, the other aspect is how much of it is retro, like people tell me, man, it's kind of 80s, a lot of the stuff I'm involved with, and I don't, I never want it to be retro, but it is kind of true, like it's, if it's angsty enough, it's 80s, you know, so I don't know what to tell you, I'd like to think that the 80s music has its own tradition, and like, which is, elaborating and making it better. I mean, that's one way to look at it, or maybe I'm just kidding myself and it's just retro, I don't know. But so that's half an answer. But there's there's honestly a problem, whether it's New York or any place else, about there are no places to play. People expect like three or four bands on a given night and want to pay $10 uh, for a, for a, to, to go to a gig, because if it's too expensive, it doesn't look like indie underground well underground enough if it's going to be too expensive and at the same time they'll pay ten dollars for a crappy glass of wine during that same evening but they don't want to pay coffee. or coffee or but they don't want to pay twenty dollars uh to just see two bands or you know they yeah well, that's, that's a, very scary i mean well, there's a lot of problems that's definitely one and people have been starting to talk about it because i i grew up with like five dollars all ages saved my life you know that 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 initial punk ethic right. And I felt it still held that it was like music should be affordable. The kids should be able to come to it. There shouldn't be, and anyone, no one should be should be excluded because they can't afford it. But then sometimes people, be, but now we've been living with the five five dollars all ages for what like thirty years. So now there's people that are saying maybe really that paradigm isn't so great anymore. Um, and um, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of problems with that. And venues, good venues, shutting down is a, a gigantic heartbreaking problem because it's like, honestly, I think that regenerating my studio, not to make it like like, like a victim or something, but regenerating my studio is a, a lot harder than like finding a new space yeah. for, for live music. So I think it's really bad, but sometimes some of these venues that close, give them a year, they'll kind of maybe sometimes with the same name, reemerge somewhere else five miles further down the subway line. Um, me, uh, yeah, that's what's scary about losing the place, for me to regenerate that. I mean, it's, it's, it's not as simple as like finding a space to put on performances. But yeah, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking that way. More questions? Ah, yes. Hi. Um, well, that leads to the question that, that I wanted to know. Um, sorry I came in a little bit late, but uh, in fact, if you do leave the place, what is the next step for you? What's the next thing you do? Well, I was really um, bummed that I actually didn't have an answer to that, and even my because the the building is supposedly because I think they're really concerned about the bad PR, um, you know, like how it looks, the the publicity and stuff like that. You know, like actually the building manager seemed a little weird, weirded out when I said I was coming to Europe to do more screenings of the documentary. <laughs> he actually was like, "Oh, so that's what you're doing over there?" Like I could see he was like thinking about it, like really. UK, Paris, Berlin, I mean, it's like, yeah, well, you know, so I think that they're concerned with that. So they were, they've been trying to talk to me, well, they're trying to find some kind of solution, you know, that, well, what, you know, so they're trying to get, they're trying to get me to, well, what would you do if, like, the building didn't exist? And I'm like, I don't know what I would do. At first I felt like, is there something wrong with me that I have no plan B? I mean, I don't have any plan B. And then I was like, I don't know. And then the guy said, what does that mean? You have no plan 
you know, in, in so many words, you have no plan B. And I'm like, so I felt kind of weird about that. Something wrong with me that I don't have anything else on my mind that I would possibly do or a place to go. And then I kind of calmed down because I think I'm pretty good with being resourceful, you know, when I know what's happening, you know, so I don't really know what's happening. I, I'm, I'm not gonna leave now, but some people, some friends of mine are like, get out. Like there's a lot of people saying, you should, this is gonna happen sooner or later. You should just take advantage of the situation now and just do it and leave and so you know, so you have control. But then I'm like, it's not me to, first of all, that's very risky. I'm in the middle of projects. I mean, I, I think it's best that I, almost the other way of looking at it is I should work as long as possible, get as many records done. That's another way of looking at it and that's almost a little bit way, the way I'm thinking. And I don't know if the, the long range planning makes a lot of sense because it could be very different a year from now, six months from now, who knows, on a lot of levels. I'm actually hoping the economy crashes. That's kind of what I'm hoping. I'm, I'm hoping for another financial crisis. <laughs>